Hey guys, Zom Fox here, and over the past couple weeks, we've seen a few big name quarterbacks come back to the UFL and go back to the teams they played in this past season. And to put it simply, it's massive. AJ McCarron, EJ Perry, Jordan Tayamu, all of them are back. So we really have almost no team with any sort of weak quarterback play, and now a bunch of teams have really good backups as well. And that begs the question of who has the best quarterback room and who has the worst. Yes, this is ranking every single quarterback room in the UFL. This is naturally mainly done by the starters, but the backups matter a lot too. We've seen in the past, whether it be the Stallions or the Maulers in the USFL, or teams like the Roughnecks in the XFL, having solid backups is a very big deal. And of course, having great third stringers, you might need them, you might not. But the starters and the backups are the two biggest ones. And with some of these teams having upwards of four quarterbacks currently on the roster, it's a pretty big deal. Now, no, Jordan Tayamo, at least officially, is technically not in the league, but is, I don't know, reports say he's signed, but there's been no official mention. But So that is a potential caveat, but that's like a very minor chance he doesn't actually come and play. He is signed, apparently, so we'll just wait for the official announcement. Again, doing a Q&A next week for 500 subscribers. If you have any questions for me, leave them down below in the comments about anything. The UFL, myself, other YouTubers. But without further ado, let's get started with number eight. The Houston Roughnecks. Is anyone shocked at this? I mean, really? Uh, the one thing you'll note is that I always like to see a guy that's proven. A proven guy that actually has shown he can be successful. We've seen a bunch of big-name spring football quarterbacks and small-name spring football quarterbacks fizzle out. So being a great college quarterback or having NFL experience doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be good. Take Brett Hundley, for example. Huge quarterback. Paid a lot of money to go to the XFL this past year and was one of the worst quarterbacks in the league. Whereas some other dudes, like a Troy Williams, you've never heard of yet, ended up being on a championship game team. They didn't win, but he was there. And with that, the Roughnecks are the worst team by a mile. They're the only team that doesn't have a legit starter. I'm putting Reed Sinnott as the starter, even though there's a good chance he might not even be it. A lot of people are pretty high on Garantano. And then you've got Nolan Henderson as well. The fact is that... Sin is the only guy with actual spring football experience, and that was basically like a game where he looked mediocre at best. So, that's the guy that has experience. Now, when you look at Jarrett, he did have injuries kind of derail the end of his career after a couple of promising years back in Tennessee with the Volunteers. And then Nolan Henderson was an awesome quarterback at Delaware, but that's, you know, not a top school. You know, that's not like a you know D1 great school. It's one of those... You know, it's not a Power 5 type of school or, you know, a massive deal. But he was still a solid quarterback there. But the fact is that they don't have a legit starter. And even their backup options is one of, if not the worst in the league as well. So you don't really have a great starter. You don't really have a great backup. You just have a couple guys that are um, prospects. But they're not even the biggest name prospects. You know, they're not like a Lindsey Scott or an Adrian Martinez. These are guys that are much lower on the spectrum of prospects. And some people have the Roughnecks as the worst team in the UFL in their power rankings, and it's solely because of this position. So, easily number eight. Now, coming in number seven is where it gets to one of the two hard ones, and that's between six and seven, but I'm putting seven as the Brahmas. The Brahmas ended up changing a lot of quarterbacks. They had a ton of players on their roster, and they cut a lot, and I wouldn't even be shocked if they changed some of these in the coming weeks. But currently, the projected starter is Quentin Dormaday, and then their backups are currently Tom Flacco and Chase Garbers. You look at Dormaday, he was in the CFL for a couple years but didn't play, but this past year with Orlando, he was, I guess, one of their main starting quarterbacks, you know. They ended up playing a few guys, but in the three games he started and the five he appeared in, he looked all right. He looked pretty solid. You know, seven TDs, four interceptions, a 95.9 pass rating, and the fact is they have his best weapon in Cody Latimer on this team now. So, all in all, they should be really solid in that regard. He has a guy that he was with this past season on the receiving end, so he should be able to be at least what he was, which is still a solid quarterback, but just one of the weaker starting quarterbacks. But then you look at their backups in Tom Flacco and Chase Garbers. There are a couple guys you that are just, you know, Tom Flacco is most famous for being the younger brother of Joe Flacco, and then Chase Garbers is a guy who was on the Raiders. He did have some stints on the active roster, though he never actually played there. But funny enough, um, Flacco actually was also a volunteer assistant coach and offense guy for Delaware so yeah it's pretty small world you know he's the same as literally the same place that Henderson was at if I'm not mistaken it's the same Delaware that he was there so pretty unique but 
I'm putting this team at 7. I think that Flacco could be a really solid addition because he has some minor coaching experience. But the fact is that he hasn't really, you know, played in a little bit. And I don't know, man. I just dominate. He's not my guy. I think there were quarterbacks better than him. And so I think they're 7. Now, coming in number 6 is going to be the Michigan Panthers. The Panthers... A lot of it is based on the game E.J. Perry had in the postseason. For those of you who don't know, E.J. Perry came in to the Panthers like at week 8-ish and then ended up starting in week 10 in what was essentially a playoff game where he didn't look awesome, but he provided a lot more of sparks, mainly because of his legs and ability in that game. And then in the championship game, the North Championship game, against the Maulers with a chance to go to the USFL title game, he put out a show. 370 yards passing on over 60 completion percentage, almost 10 yards per attempt, two TDs, only one pick, almost a 100 passer rating, and then he's had a touchdown on the ground as well. He was really solid in that game and looked incredible. Now, the backups, Danny Etling, a lot of people have a lot of promise for him. He was drafted back in 2018 as a seventh round pick, and he had been bouncing around practice squads for a while. I mean, we're talking about a dude who's been to a lot of different places. New England, Atlanta, Seattle, Minnesota, Denver, Green Bay, Jacksonville. So he has a lot of practice squad experience, and he is technically a Super Bowl champion. Then you look at guys like Davis Cheek and Brian Lewerke. Lewerke was actually on this team this past season, so he has some familiarity with the offense that they're going to have, which is a big deal. And then Cheek is a guy that the Breakers ended up getting, but naturally because of how good MBT was, he never ended up playing. I think this team is barely above... The Brahmas, because I personally like Perry more than Dormaday. I know Dormaday is technically more proven since Perry really only played in two games. But I think that overall Perry is a much higher ceiling than Dormaday. And then backup-wise, I'd rather have Etling than either of the two guys that the Brahmas have. So because of that, I'm putting him at six. The number five and one of the easiest spots on the list is the Renegades. I think this is one of those insanely obvious ones. They're clearly better than the three teams below them, but they're clearly not as good as the top four teams. Is the fact is that they do have four guys in their roster. Their projected starter is Luis Perez, but they have a really solid backup to a lot of people's eyes in Lindsey Scott Jr. And then you have Holton at Allers, and then you have Drew Plitt. Plitt was the quarterback this past year for a while, but in the games he played, he really wasn't that great. Three TDs to five interceptions, sub seven yards per attempt. Solid completion percentage, but overall there's a reason why he wasn't the starter and why Luis Perez ended up taking his job. And Perez in the playoffs was great. Over a 70 completion percentage for over a 130 passer rating. If it wasn't for how incredible Magoo was in the two games he had in the USFL games, or the USFL playoffs, we'd be looking at Perez as having this miracle playoff run. It's just that Magoo was, like, even better than what Perez was. But don't let that fool you. Perez was incredible in the two playoff games. They don't win the championship game if it wasn't for him. But the issue is that he's a barely a top five quarterback in the league, in my opinion. I think he is probably fifth for me arguably fourth but I think that the other teams that are above him have better backups or more experienced backups because Lindsey Scott Jr. there's a lot of promise for him and a lot of hope this is a dude who was really solid in college you know he wasn't on you know the biggest schools but he was a first team all SLC he was an FCS first team all-american and he does have the most passing touchdowns in an FCS season at 60 and then when you look at Allers he also is the Stat-wise, the greatest ECU quarterback of all time. He has, like, all their records. So, this is a solid group, but I feel like the guys, the teams above them have a much better starting quarterback, and their backups are either a bit better or pretty close. So, the running aids, I know some people might want to have them higher, but I think that overall, this is pretty much where they should be. Now, number four is one of the two really tough ones. Four and three are really close, but I'm putting four as the Battlehawks. Four and three, I think both their starters are basically dead even. It's just that... I think the team at three has better backups. So when you look at this team, it's A.J. McCarron, the massive signing. He was great this last season. He was one of the best quarterbacks in spring football, over a 100 passer rating. 24 to 6 TDD interception ratio is incredible in spring football. He was just incredible. He had a great receiver in Hakeem Butler, but overall he was still incredible. Now the issue is their backups. Manny Wilkins is a guy. You know, he's one of those guys that some people say, oh, he has a lot of promise but you haven't really seen him. And then you have Brandon Silvers, who most Roughnecks fans don't really like because he was just kind of mid. He's much like, the if you were a USFL fan only, he's much like the Cole Kelly of the the XFL, where he's a guy that you know deep down in your heart is better than a lot of other quarterbacks, but you also know deep down in your heart there's a ton of guys better than him. He's like the definition of mid. And so it's not awful to have as your backup, but I think that... 
the team above them and really all three teams have better options in the backup area and their starter quarterback is either just as good or a bit better, arguably. Arguably. Because Silvers has been a, around a while in spring football using the AF and the 2020 XFL. But neither of those leagues either did he look incredible. He just looked okay. So, putting the battle locks at four. And number three is the defenders. I think Tayamu and McCarron are both pretty much equal. I think there's arguments for one way or the other. When you look at Tayamu with the XFL in 2020, the USFL in 2022, and his past season, he's always been one of the higher tier quarterbacks. I do think he's, his season in 22 was a bit overrated in the USFL. He was still really solid, don't get me wrong. But I think a lot of people gave him a lot more praise than he should have gotten, even though he was truly great. And I think in hindsight, I don't know. I think he was great, but he did throw a lot of interceptions there. He didn't have great protection, though. And I think seeing what Cookus did this past year, even worse protection. I, I don't know. But this past season with DC, whew, he was Offensive Player of the Year for a reason. He was incredibly efficient. 14 TDs to 3 interceptions. The same amount of TDs he had with the Bandits the year prior. But he cut down the interceptions by 75%. Over a 100 passer rating. And in the playoffs, that's the only issue. The only issue I have with him is that in the postseason, he kind of disappeared. Five interceptions. There's no excuse for that. Especially when you're only having four TDs. He was one of the biggest reasons why DC didn't end up winning the championship game. But even if I were to give the edge to McCarron, I'd rather have McClendon and Francois any day as backups. McClendon, I think, is the most slept-on quarterback in the entire league. in a set, Well, second most slept-on quarterback in the league. This dude was really solid with a team that was awful. Look, Vegas was absolute garbage this past season. And he looked solid. Five TDs, one interception, over 800 yards, and only a few games played. Now, Francois only played in a couple as well, and he looked all right. But I think that McClendon is one of the most slept-on quarterbacks. If Tayama were to get hurt or something, they have a really solid backup that could still bring him back to the championship game. And Francois is still a decent option. I think that overall, this team is a bit better than the Batterhawks. But now we get to the top two, and number two, I'm putting the Birmingham Stallions. Yeah, a lot of people are going to be like, whoa, you're putting them at two? Yeah, I'm not putting them at one. Like I said, I like the proven guys. Because number one, J.M.R. Smith is the most slept on quarterback in the league this year. Look, I think that he's his you know tweet about the USFL or the UF, the USFL PA getting the you know new agreement was pretty unwarranted about acting about how they got a pay raise and he was upset about it. The fact is, he is a damn good quarterback. People seem to forget that even though in 2022 his stats, counting-wise, like his passer rating being 78.7 isn't great, for about two-thirds of the season, he was the MVP. It's just that he got, like, sick, minor injuries caught up to him. And so the last few games, he was playing not even remotely in 100%. And he was still putting up decent yards and, you know, TDs and all that. And he still had two TDs on the ground as well. He was one of the best quarterbacks in the USFL that year. I believe I ranked him fourth best quarterback in the league that year. And that was, you know, when you had both DeAndre Johnson at his peak. You had Luis Perez at an insane level. And you had Case Cook at insane levels. And then here's the reason I think this team is getting a bit overrated. Matt Corral and Adrian Martinez have not played spring football. The idea that they're just going to be great quarterbacks in this league because, hey, you know, Martinez was really solid against good college teams. It's counting wise, you know, stat wise, he was pretty solid. Or that Corral was a third round pick. Again, we saw Brett Hundley. This was a legit NFL starter for a while. He was the starter for the Packers when Aaron Rodgers went down with a collarbone injury. And we saw him be absolute trash. We've seen guys like Cardell Jones be massive signings, end up being trash. So the idea that just because Corral was a third round pick is going to be great, I don't buy it. And he did have a really bad foot injury as well. Yeah, lip strength foot injury. So, the idea that he's going to come back at 100% is also a bit crazy. So, I think Corral, in theory, is the best backup in the whole league. Because, in theory, you're talking about a third-round NFL prospect just a couple of years ago. And a dude who was really solid at Ole Miss. I was actually very happy the Panthers drafted him. I am both a Michigan and Carolina Panthers fan. I really liked him getting drafted there. I thought he was one of the most slept-on quarterbacks. But then he, you know, had the massive injury. And then everything just went downhill from there. Now, Jalen Morton is probably going to be the guy that ends up getting cut, as he is the odd man out here. He was on the team this past year, but he never played. And then Martinez played at K-State. He played at Nebraska. Solid quarterback. But I'm putting this team at two. I think at number one, you have legit spring football veterans who have proven that why they are in this league, whereas these three guys that are backing up Jamar, not as much. It's pretty much a given at this point that Magoo is not coming back, barring a miracle. 
But I think that Smith is going to be a really solid start. I think that overall this is still better than DC. I think that Jamar is a bit below Te'amu and McCarron. But I think that when you're talking about high-end talent-wise, I gotta admit, Martinez and Corral both have a lot more of a high-end ceiling than pretty much anyone but maybe McClendon. But number one is going to be the Memphis Showboats. This should be obvious. Your worst quarterback is basically is the Brandon Silvers of the USFL and Cole Kelly. A proven guy that is good but is not great. He was solid-ish. Yes, he threw a lot of interceptions, admittedly. That was the big issue. But again, it's not like the Showboats team was, you know, super talented. Vinny Pepel and Derek Dillon were the two best receivers. And those two guys are really solid, but on a lot of other teams, they'd be this number two receiver, not vying for the number one spot. And this team had a lot of issues and injuries in the running back position the entire season. And rushing-wise, he was still a solid one. He had two touchdowns on the ground. But the big deal is that, on paper, they have the best backup in the league. Look, I saw him live. I can attest that in the championship game, T. Will looked really bad. But if you forget that game, this team, the Met Maulers, made it to the championship game because of him. Look, the defense was incredible. But when they had James Morgan in at quarterback, this team was so much worse. Look, Garrett Groshek and Madre London both were colossal disappointments this past season. They're supposed to be the, Tro the Trey Williams-Darius Victor pairing for the Maulers. And instead, it was Troy Williams ended up basically leading the team in rushing every week he was playing. In the eight games he started, he like led them in rushing in at least like five of them, maybe more of them. Hence why he ended up with over 340 yards, which is actually good enough for eighth in the league. And his passing stats weren't bad either. 1,400 yards, 6-3 to TD interception ratio, above an 85 passer rating. And he only fumbled the ball once. I think that all in all, saying the fact that we haven't seen Lindsey Scott play, we haven't seen Matt Corral play, I think that Troy Williams is the best backup in the entire league at this point. There's a good chance that he ends up falling down that spot. I think McClendon has a lot of ceiling. But at least right now, I wouldn't buy an argument to why somebody else is better than Troy Williams as the backup. Then Case Kukis. He is still arguably the best spring football quarterback. He had no offensive line, and he still put up one of the best seasons in the U.S. this past season. 2,294 yards. That was more than Alex Magoo. 15 TDs to 9 interceptions. Not the best. Much worse than what he had the year prior. But again, no offensive line. Yet he actually gained in rushing yards. Granted, his average took a massive hit, which, to be fair, one of those rushes of the 22 was like a massive rush. Wink, wink. But the fact is that Case Cookies is still incredible. This dude in the one playoff run he had was great, and once he got hurt, we knew the season was over for them and they lost the championship game. Putting him on this team, I think there's a very real argument that I would still put Cookies as the number one spring football quarterback above Jamar, above McCarron, above Te'amu. Because I've seen Cookies be incredible. You give him what McCarron had this past season, you give him what Te'amu had this past season, I think he's doing just as, if not better, than those two guys. So in my opinion, they have the best starter in the league and the best backup in the league. And they have one of, if not, the best third stringer in the league. So, I look on that, it's obvious to me, Showboats are number one. So that'll do it for this list. This has been Zom Fox. If you have any, you know, gripes with the list, let me know down below in the comments. I know some people usually like to see the high-end talent kind of stuff, to where why you would have a team like the Stallions at number one. I personally don't. I think, like... Three and four are pretty close. You can argue back and forth. I think six and seven are pretty close. You can argue back and forth. That's pretty much it. Again, doing the Q&A next week. So if you have any questions for me, leave them down in the comments. And as always, have a great night.